This is section 1.1 notes continued. Now we're looking at graphs and we're going to use the graphs below along with a table to establish a pattern and write an algebraic expression. So you're familiar with graphs such as this. We're going to draw a chart to establish the pattern displayed in the graph. The same type of chart that we created for the previous two problems. So you can see the inputs, here are the x values, so we have the inputs of 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, and we want to establish a pattern for n, for any input. The process, then, let's, let's see first, let's enter in uh, the outputs. So we have 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 as our outputs associated with our inputs. 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So what is the pattern? What is the process? It looks like for each input to get to the output, we just add 1. So we have the 1 plus 1, the 2 plus 1, the 3 plus 1, and so on. And therefore, our rule becomes n plus 1. Example 4, the graph of the, to the, at the right, uh, we're going to use that to respond to the following questions. So the title is Class Field Trip. We're looking at the number of students on the x-axis as our input and the bottles of water as our output or y values. So you can see the pattern. We're trying to establish a pattern. How many bottles of water are needed if five students attend? So we can see if one attends, we need two bottles. And so we can start to see this pattern. Two bottle, or two students need four bottles, three students need six bottles. So you can imagine that four students would need eight and five students would need 10 bottles. So how many bottles of water are needed if 20 students attend? So it's become evident, hopefully, that each student needs two bottles of water. So for 20 students, we would need two bottles each for a total of 40 bottles. And lastly, how many bottles of water are needed if n students attend? So we would just make our rule 20n. Complete the tables below. So we're going to use the figure here, and you can see uh, the pattern establishing of adding a row for each new figure. It says draw the next two figures, so we could go ahead and draw, oh, I already got it. So we have one, we actually have kind of this column establishing. So we have our first row, and then we add on two to the next row, and then each preceding row would also have, let's see, so this is our second, and so we add another row here, for a total of five, and so we just need to add that next row. So for this one it would be so we're adding 2 to 5 and that would be 7. So we don't need this row yet. And then the next figure after that similarly running into there a little bit, sorry about that. And so copy and complete the table, we did that one, to find the number of squares in each figure. So we see here 
that uh, we have the input in oh we skipped a we'll go back to a uh, the input for our first figure is one and the output then would be one there are three squares in our second figure and we add uh, not three three plus one four and then we have our four and then we're adding on five more so that's nine and then in our next one we have our nine and then we're adding on seven more so we get sixteen and twenty five so maybe these numbers look familiar uh, in the first one the process we can start to see is to multiply the figure number, the input, times itself. And there's your pattern. Back to the first example here, our example A. So we have one to get to five, two to get to nine. What's happening here? Three to get to 13. So are we doing times four and plus one is what it looks like here? Times four plus one. So five times four plus one would be 21. You can also see the pattern is going up by four each time. And that actually helps us if we look at just the outputs to establish what we should be multiplying by. So we have uh, then for the nth input, the output would be 4n plus 1. Back to part b, we need to write that rule as well. Uh, we copied and now we need to write a rule which would be n times n or n squared. On the next side here, we're talking about section 1.2. So we've just transitioned sections, and we have a goal here to be able to graph and order real numbers. And so also to be able to identify properties of real numbers. So two different goals. First, you've probably seen this figure before, this Venn diagram, which helps us to consider all of the different groups of numbers. First, we have the natural numbers. And those are counting numbers. Those are the first numbers you talk about in kindergarten. And the, we use an N to represent natural numbers. The next set we learn about zero is whole numbers. So that's a W for whole numbers. And all of the whole numbers, the, the natural numbers, are all included within the whole numbers. And then we learn about integers. And for integers, we actually use the letter Z. We reserve i for something else later. So we're using z, and that includes our negative numbers, our whole numbers, and 0. Next are our rational numbers, and those are numbers, uh, we actually use the letter q, and the q actually stands for quotient. So those are numbers that can be written as a fraction. All of these numbers can be written as a fraction. And of course, all of these numbers, and these and these, can also be written as a fraction if we simply put them over 1. And then on the other side of the Venn diagram are the irrational numbers. You notice there's not overlap in those two sections. Irrational numbers are numbers that uh, do not terminate and do not repeat. So maybe make a note of that. Do not terminate, meaning they do not end. There is no end to the decimals here. Do not terminate and do not repeat. There's no pattern as there is here and the point to repeating. So rational numbers are all numbers you can write as a quotient of integers. A over B, where B does not equal zero. They include terminating decimals, such as 1 eighth or 0.125. And they include repeating decimals. For example, 1 third can be written as 0.3 repeating. For irrational numbers, they have decimal uh, representations that neither terminate nor repeat. So there that is again. For example, the square root of 2. The square root of any number that is not a perfect square will lead to a, an irrational number. And they cannot be written as the quotient of integers. 
So for example, your school is sponsoring a charity race. Which set of numbers does not contain the number of people P who participate in the race? And the number of people that participate in the race could be a natural number because that includes, we, we obviously would need a positive number or zero. So uh, integers include those options. Rational numbers, so again, since integers and whole numbers are included within rational numbers, then of course we could find those values in rational numbers, the set of rational numbers, but not in the set of irrational numbers. Example two, graph the numbers. So we're going to draw a number line. Looking at these values, negative five halves, sometimes it's easier to write them as a decimal, so we're going to write negative five halves as negative 2.5. The square root of two you can simply enter into your calculator and you get, let's see, the square root of two is 1.4. and then 2.6 repeating, and that's already written as a decimal. So we can go ahead, on our graph we need to go down to negative three and up to positive three. And fill in the rest. And then we plot our points. Negative five halves would be right here between negative two and negative three. And we're gonna go back and write them in their initial form when we graph them and the square root of 2 is 1.4, so we'd find that here. Oops, square root of 2. And 2.6 repeating is just past halfway between 2 and 3, so the 2.6 repeating. Next we compare the square root of 17, which would be an irrational number since 17 is not a perfect square, and 3.8. So one easy way to do that would be to think about, well, what is close to the square root of 17 that is a perfect square? And that would be the square root of 16. So the square root of 16 we know is 4. And we know the square root of 15 is greater than, or sorry, the square root of 17 would be even greater than the square root of 16. Since 4 is greater than 3.8, we therefore know that the square root of 17 would be greater than 3.8 as well. You could also enter into your calculator to double check the square root of 17 equals approximately, I'm going to use my squiggle lines for my equal sign to represent approximately equal to, so square root of 17 is approximately equal to 4.123, which of course also is a greater than 3.8. And our last page. Here we have our different properties for real numbers. Starting with the opposite or additive inverse of any number a is negative a. So that's our phrase additive inverse we should be familiar with. The sum of a number and its opposite is zero. So the additive identity would be adding two numbers together and getting zero. Next we talk about the terms reciprocal or also known as the multiplicative inverse. Of any non-zero number, a is one over a. So for example, we can see that 8 and 1 eighth are multiplicative inverses or reciprocals. And we also know that the product of a number and its reciprocal is always 1. And that comes in handy. These all come in handy as we're solving algebraic expressions. You can take a look at the chart here and we have some other properties. The closure property here is represented by a plus b is a real number and the multiplication version of the closure property would be a times b is a real number. Next the commutative property and think of the word commute here 
and that is when we have two values that can switch places when we add them or multiply them and get the same result. The associative property, think about who you associate with, so you're, who you are grouped with. In this property we see A plus B, the group, plus C is going to be equal to A plus the group B plus C. Notice that the order is the same, the groups have just changed, and this also applies in multiplication. La uh, next is the identity property. For, so for addition, our additive identity is zero. So if we add zero, we still get the same result. For multiplication, one is the multiplicative identity. So anything times one it has that same result. Next is the inverse property. And so we have uh, what we talked about a little bit above, which is when we add a number, plus its opposite, we get zero. And when we multiply a number times its reciprocal or multiplicative inverse, we get one. And of course, a cannot be zero. That would make the denominator zero. And lastly, the distributive property. And the distributive property is when we have a value outside of parentheses with an operation happening, addition or subtraction within the parentheses, we distribute the value outside. So A times B is AB, and A times C is AC. Which property does this equation illustrate? So we have some examples here. So we have negative 2 thirds times negative 3 halves is 1. So that's your multiplicative inverse. This one's tricky a little bit because you see the parentheses, so you may want to think about uh, associative property, or you may want to think about distributive property, uh, but actually notice that the order is different on both sides. And therefore, this is actually representing the commutative property of multiplication. And lastly, we have three outside parentheses, g plus h plus 2g. And now, in the result, we have 3g plus 3h plus 2g. The 2g stays the same, so what's different? Well, the distributive property happened, so we'll label that distributive property. And this concludes your notes.